And I'm going to cover several tips. We'll try and get through all 10 if we can, but I will keep an eye on the clock. Now, I don't want to just preach these tips to you. Uh, I want to frame them within what I see quite often as the most uh, popular kind of issues or topics or challenges that I hear from teachers that I work with in this particular region. And I want also this to be an interactive session. So there's two layers of interactivity. I either want you to agree or disagree with each of the challenges. Is, is it like that in your context? And if you want to take that to a deeper level, I'd also like to hear your experiences as well. So I've got two questions for each challenge. I will then suggest what my tip is. And the tip is something to support professional development, an area of focus that you might want to undertake in this academic year to help, as I've mentioned there, uh, develop your own professional development, leading to better teaching and learning environments. Professional development should always support the advancement of teaching and learning in your classroom. It should be of a benefit to your students. I also want to make it as practical as possible. So when I talk about the tip, I'd like to give some ideas, hopefully some things that you can take away. And then finally, for each tip, I'm going to suggest something that you can do to extend that learning in the future, because we have our Global Teachers Festival. This is the biggest uh, activity in the Macmillan education calendar. It's starting in a 10 days time on the 19th of February. It runs for two full weeks and it's an online festival and it's got 22, I think, different. Yeah, I have. This is what I've got. Like honey and lemon right here. Uh, 22 talks over two weeks. And I'm going to suggest some of those talks related to the tips that I've got. So without further ado, let's get going. So the first challenge that I've chosen, and I want you to agree or disagree, is around exposure to English. This is something that I hear quite often in the Middle East and North Africa. And that is that many students don't have exposure to English outside of the classroom. The class itself, our English classes, are the only times that students interact with English. So I'd like to know, is this something that's familiar to you? Does, is English used in the out of classroom context? Or is this something that you find a particular challenge as well? And if you want to extend that, please do use the chat box. What do you do to kind of compensate for that? How do you try to make me uh, English meaningful? Because I think if it is the only place where students see it, they see it as a subject. They say, this is the only place I am only going to use English in the classroom. This is the only place I need to really care about English. So it seems like a few people are saying, yes, this is uh, very true for many of our students as well. Yeah, and we've got this thing, Fiona, you're talking about whether we use L1 in the classroom or not. So that's uh, an interesting thing, aspect to consider as well. I need to move this out of the way because it's in the way. So if many students don't have uh, exposure to English outside of the classrooms, we need to make learning meaningful for them inside of the classroom. We need to somehow connect learning, problem is I've got the chat box in the way, I can't read it. We need to somehow connect learning to their everyday lives. And I think that even if it is the only time that they see English, many English topics are familiar everyday topics. We see things like the environment, travel, family, sports, all of these types of common um, topics that we see in course books. But I think that one thing we could work on in our professional development plan is something called activating schemata. Now, most of you probably already do this, and that's absolutely fine. If you say, I do this already, I activate schemata with my students. Great, I'm glad to hear that you do. Activating schemata is just finding out really what students already know about this particular topic. Now, if we're thinking about this within the context of professional development, it's not a case of, do I do this or do I not do this? Actually, professional development is about how can I continuously improve what I am doing with students? So if you are activating schemata, we can be questioning ourselves in terms of, well, where do I activate schemata? Do I just do it at the beginning of the unit? Do I do it at the beginning of each activity? 
do I do it? Or how do I do it is another better question. Lots of people activate schemata by asking questions, which is the most natural way. Asking students, what do you already know? Perhaps putting them into pairs. You know, come up with vocabulary that you already know about this topic. That is one way to do it. We can continuously develop that. Does it have to be verbal? Can they write something? Can they draw something? Can they act something out? There's lots of different ways. And that, again, this is where that L1 that Fiona was talking about can play a part. L1 can help them to understand the topic that we're going to be talking about. So how can we move them from L1 into L2? But they might want to use a little bit of L1 when they're having conversations and thinking about the topic more broadly. Let's look at an, an, exa an example of that. So for example, we quite often activate schemata at the beginning of a unit. So the unit opener will quite often have a visual. And we would say things like, okay, ask your partner, do you like pizza? And they'd say, yes, do you like pizza? Yes, I like pizza. Is this activating schemata or are we? can we extend that? Maybe they can act out uh, a party that they went to. Maybe they could create a party. This could be in L1, but it helps them to frame that topic, give them something to come back to. Yeah, this idea of scaffolding that Sadiq is talking about in the chat box. So think about how you can really extend uh, these kind of pre-work activities rather than just kind of going in. Right, the topic is um, parties and I'm going to pre-teach you the vocabulary that you need for this unit. Get them to think about it in a kind of broader and more deeper level. We can also do it in other parts of the unit as well. So for example, we have a reading over on the right-hand side. How can we activate schemata around this particular reading? Could we give them an activity where they have to perhaps research, uh, go away and in pairs, find out different ways that people communicate? Yep. How do people use time in your country? Maybe personalize some of the content rather than just, you know, it's Tuesday, open your books, do the reading, answer the questions. I like this idea of going down memory lane. That's a really nice way of thinking about activating schemata. So this is my first tip, activating schemata. If you want to know more about this as a topic, if this is something you'd like to focus on in your professional development plan for this year, you might want to attend Thursday's uh, Global Teachers Festival where Rachel will be talking all about this. You'll have one whole hour rather than just my five minutes about how do we actually use schemata? How do we build on that in the classroom? So I'll uh, share the registration again at the end. You only need to register once for the whole festival and you can pick and choose which sessions you want to choose, but this might be one that you're interested in. Okay, the second challenge, I'm gonna stick with the theme of exposure. So I've been thinking about it inside of the classroom, activating schemata with my students uh, as we're going along. I don't know where this drawing has come from at the bottom, but that's okay. But what about outside of the classroom? So I can do some work inside of the classroom because I control the learning environments. I can do activation of schemata. I can make it meaningful. I can personalize my content. But what about when my students leave the class? Is there going to be a week until they see, or another 24 hours until they see me and English again? Or are there ways that you guys inspire your students to use English beyond the classroom? I'll allow people a minute just to put their ideas if they wish. Because I think that there are many ways now that students can connect with others, unless you are in a completely technology deficient environment where you have no access to either technology or the internet. If your students do, if they have a phone, if they have a computer at home, if they have access to the internet, there are myriad ways that students can now connect with other people. We can send them videos to watch, yep. Practice more freer speech, yep. It'd be interesting to know how you do that, Yusuf, um, because that's quite a difficult thing for them to do. Send them podcasts. Okay, so videos and podcasts are really great. They can interact with English outside of the classroom, but these are still kind of quite receptive, right? So they're working on their receptive skills, which are valuable. I'm certainly not going to say that they're not. But what about productive skills? It's very difficult for them to practice productive skills outside of the classroom. Contributing in activities like broadcasting. Yeah, maybe they are doing their own podcast. They could be doing uh, podcasts just with other students in their school, which is a really nice way. 
working on projects. Projects are a wonderful way of getting them to interact. Yep, good. And then, yep, using advertisements. Okay, so seeing things in the environment. Yep, of course, chat TTP. I'm going to come on to that a little bit later, practicing conversations. So loads of great ideas. And it's great to see that you guys are all really thinking about ways that your students can take the English outside of the classroom and start to interact with it, start to make meaning of it, start to see that it has a different purpose than just learning English in class, maybe passing an exam or, or passing a test. So one that I've got here, and this builds on one of the other sessions. If you did see uh, Harry, has Harry been yet or not? I can't remember. But uh, I know that Harry Waters is going to be part of the Educast conference. Yeah, not yet. Tomorrow. Not. It's tomorrow, right? Yes. I was oh, yeah. Getting confused. Yeah, it's fine. So one thing that you might want to build into your professional development plan is youth empowerment and global connections. So how can we help our students to connect with other English speakers? Now, I don't mean native speakers. I mean people who are just like them. Same age, perhaps at the same level. There's ways that we can do this. Traditionally, it's been very difficult, but the internet, of course, is helping us to come up with lots of ways to do that. It'd be interesting to know, actually, has anybody connected their students with students in perhaps another school, perhaps in another country? What, and it'd be interesting to know your kind of experience around that, because it is challenging, but it is something that people have started to do. A free website call, yep, your English pal. Great, wonderful. So if you can find opportunities for this, that's great. Macmillan has one, it's called Empatico. Uh, you can find it on the Macmillan website. So we have one uh, course, which is for teenagers called Gateway to the World. And in that course, they get to do projects. So this is good collaborative activities that students can do together in class. And then when they produce the end part of the project, they can connect with another school who's also done the same project and then they can share their experience, they can share their findings, share their ideas. And this is a really good way for them to see that, A, people think differently in different parts of the world. We've done it with students in Egypt, connecting with students in Italy most recently. And it's great to see that students can connect with students who are just like them, same age, you know, same kind of challenges that they have, rather than if we just have them watching videos or watching podcasts with kind of fluent English. This is like, okay, actually, these guys have a similar English level to us. We've got to be brave, we've got to present. And it gives them, you know, that additional confidence and boost, I think. So try and find ways of connecting with other schools. It could just be uh, a school in your country, in your region, in your town, a t another teacher that you know who's teaching the same level as you. It could be within your own school. Try to find as many opportunities as possible for students to connect with other students outside of their classroom and structure that. Give them something very clear and concise, a very concise goal that they're working towards. We have to present this and come up with questions. Role play is a nice way of doing that. So this is another idea that you can do, and this helps to empower your students. It will give them a greater sense of confidence um, in terms of using English, in terms of seeing other students use English. And I think that's a really powerful um, thing that they can be doing. The other thing you can do is look at our Advancing Futures website. Again, if you go to macmillanenglish.com and go to the Advancing Futures section, you'll find something called Change Makers. So we believe that students can use English for the power of good. They can create positive impacts on the world. So not just learning, I was listening to the previous presentation and he was talking very much about students doing things, making it very active. But if students do do things and it works very well, they come up with a really good project, they come up with a really good idea about something that they're perhaps doing within their own country, we believe that they should be able to share that and again, build that confidence up. So there's something called the Change Maker site. They can contribute a project into that platform and they can see what other students in other parts of the world are doing. There are hundreds of different projects on there, all related to sustainability. It could be environmental sustainability. It could be social projects, all the good things that students do around the world. So go and check that out as well. 
And as I said, Harry Waters is going to be here tomorrow, but he's also at the Global Teachers Festival, and he's going to be talking with Margarita about this in more detail. So what is the change major project and how can students contribute to that? How can they make a difference? How can they have their voices heard across the world? Moving students away from being passive recipients of education and uh, turn them into kind of active participants, both in the learning process, but also in this idea of making the world a better place. Students should be a big part of that, I think. Okay, moving on to challenge number three, <clears throat> moving away from exposure. I think that motivation is probably the next biggest topic that comes up in my conversations with teachers across the Middle East and North Africa. Quite often they say things like, and again, this can relate to that idea of exposure, this idea that English could be considered by students as one of the more kind of boring topics. Does that relate to you in your context? Do your students naturally find it boring? Or is it one of their favorite subjects? Maybe it could be one of their favorite subjects. And if it is one of their favorite subjects, the good there is a good chance that you do something personally to make English fun for them. You make it meaningful, you make it engaging, you make it fun, and this changes their concept of English. If English is just a subject to be taught, then naturally we're gonna find it boring. And I think the reason for this, if we're putting ourselves in the shoes of our students, is that for most students, especially ones that are going to school, you're being forced to learn. Yep, every day you turn up at school, you haven't made any decision about what it is that you're going to learn. You don't choose the topics, you don't choose the pace, you don't choose the activities. You're just kind of handheld, taken through that kind of learning process. And of course, you're tested at the end of it. Did you learn? Did you remember all of the things that we did? Now, this of course is not intrinsically motivating for many students. And many students will disconnect because of that. So is this true in your context? Is it fun, not fun? Do students naturally come to class and say English is the most amazing thing that I ever do in my day-to-day -day life? Probably yes, Fiona says, not at all. So one of the things I want us to think about then is this idea of wonder. And I want us to perhaps, again, build into our professional development plans this idea of the psychology of motivation, the psychology of learning. Think about what you do uh, outside of the classroom, the things that you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in sports. Maybe you're interested in podcasts. Maybe you're interested in movies. Think about TV shows, Netflix. How does Netflix make you interested to watch something? Or for example, when a movie comes into the theater, how do they attract your attention? How do they make you want to watch that movie? And they have very specific ways of doing it. Marketing obviously is a huge, huge industry. But how can we take some of those uh, ideas and perhaps bring them into our teaching and learning? Now, of course, if we bring them in on Monday morning or in the Middle East and North Africa on a Sunday morning, and we say, okay, topic for this week is transport, open your books to page 76. Uh, you can see that there is a picture, look at the vocabulary, maybe listen to something. We're not developing that sense of wonder, are we? So there's things that we can do to try and attract our students in. We talked a little bit about activating schemata and that can definitely help. But we can definitely think of other ways and develop other ways to set our students up. For example, if every activity that we do is completed in one sitting, they just get the activity, they complete the activity, we move on to the next thing. For example, if we use worksheets, not a lot of wonder in that. If we set up things like running dictations, then there's a person, there's a, there's a gap between the information and me, and there's an activity that helps them. Yeah? One person has to run, find something out, bring it back. You answer a question together. We're creating a dynamic. Yeah? So think a little bit about how you set up activities and whether or not you give them information or whether they have to search for that information. Uh, and that can create this sense of wonder. Let me give you an example of how we do that because sometimes within modern course books, they help you to do this. So for example, this is a unit opener. This is a primary, a high level primary course. 
traditionally, we would have looked at the picture, we would have uh, had a set of vocabulary words attached to this, we would pre-teach them that, getting them to highlight, maybe we would, we would use flashcards, not particularly motivating for students. Now we try to get students to delve deeper. Yep, so we yes, we can look at the picture, what can you see? But we want to get them thinking, we want to get them investigating, we want to draw into that power of the imagination. What do you think is going on? Yep. And this helps students to um, attach to the content a little bit deeper, I think. So think about this idea of wonder. How can you um, do something to inspire your students to try to want to see your content? If it's a story, maybe you just give them a character at the beginning. So they don't know what the story is, but they have to try to figure out what the story might be. These kind of prediction types of activities that you can do. What do you think the who do you think the character is? Who else do you think is going to be within the story? What do you think is going to happen? You can kind of drip feed them bits of the story. You could give them a frame and ask them, okay, what happened before? What happens next? Who is it that's looking into the picture? All of these types of activities can help students to create that sense of wonder. And we have the wonderful Miriam, who's going to be coming to talk a little bit more about this power of wonder. At the festival, this is on Wednesday the 21st. So you might want to join that session and learn all about how to set up activities to create this sense of curiosity. Yeah, like a counselor in disguise, nice. Okay, I'm gonna stick again with the motivation theme. So some students find it a little bit boring, but also even if they don't find it boring, People today think that students quite often lose interest in the topic quite quickly. So do your students lose interest in a topic quickly? And what kinds of things do you do to try to keep them on task? Sometimes a unit lasts one week, sometimes a topic lasts two weeks, all of these types of things. And I've put this because a, co a common comment that I hear from teachers in my region is that resilience levels of students are maybe getting worse. Now, I'm not sure if there's any research behind that, or whether that's just a general observation, but a common thing that I hear is that because of technology, because of shortening attention spans and this fight that teachers seem to be having with technology in general, they feel like it's either me or you know, social media, that's it. It's one or the other. And I'm always constantly fighting against that. They have a very short attention span because social media is like that. It's very much like next, 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 scroll, scroll, scroll. Teachers feel like they fight against that. So one of the things that we might want to do is work with our school team to develop a plan to develop resilience or what used to be known as grit, how to develop grit. And I, again, saw this in the previous um, presentation that Mohammed was talking about this idea of resilience and developing that with students. Now, if you just go into class on a Thursday afternoon and think to yourself, I'm going to develop some resilience with these students, you're probably going to come up against quite a lot of resistance. It's not something that you can develop with students overnight, but it is something that we can be continuously working on with our students. Again, I just mentioned whether or not activities can be completed in a single sitting. Now, if every single thing that you do with students is always, okay, give you a task, you complete the task, we do the feedback on the task, and we move on to something new. Is that developing resilience with our students? Perhaps we could do a little bit better than that. So think about how you can combine certain activities so that maybe they have to come back. They do three activities, and they've got to go back to the first one to see whether or not they're improving. So think about how, and this is gonna be a school-wide thing. So each year group will also need to be involved. Again, if you're trying to do this by yourself, it can be very, very difficult. But if it's a school-wide effort, okay, how can we develop resilience with our students? Okay, we need to make activities longer, but maybe not longer in one sitting. Maybe it can be projects. So for 10 minutes or 15 minutes of each lesson, or one lesson each week over a month. So they get four different lessons on the same topic. They can create a project. In the first sitting, they can do brainstorming. In the second session, they can create a plan. In the third one, they can actually create a draft for the project itself. 
And in the fourth one, they can review the draft and create a final. Yep. So it's not always, okay, you just do move on, do move on. Think about how we can develop activities to develop this idea of resilience. And again, at the Global Teachers Festival, uh, there's going to be a session talking about this idea of resilience, and he's going to draw on some research-based approaches. So you might want to do this. Again, another part of resilience is making mistakes. So if you are just doing things and correcting it and sending it back, moving on to the next activity, we need to find ways to allow students to make mistakes so that they can learn from those mistakes. Making mistakes needs to be something that is okay in the language classroom. Otherwise, students just won't want to do it. And again, that breaks down that idea of motivation as well. Okay, fifth challenge. So we've got, we've had uh, exposure and motivation. Let's move on to some different uh, aspects now. Let's go to the classic grammar. I saw somebody mentioned in the chat box something about grammar before. You might need to remind me what it was because it's gone quite far down the chat box now. But of course, students find grammar difficult. Yes, is that true for you? Your students uh, find grammar difficult? And do you find yourself then ending up spending a lot of time trying to teach them grammar? Let's see, uh, people, I'm gonna take a drink. Take a, take a moment for my lemon and honey. How do you find grammar? Yes, I am saying. I think one of the dangers is the more students struggle with the grammar, the more we try to force them to learn it. And we get into this vicious cycle of them becoming more frustrated because they don't understand it, us becoming more frustrated with them because we think they should be able to understand and use it because we've covered it so many times. And you go home and you bang your head against the wall. I don't understand why they cannot just get this grammar points and use it. We've done it so many times. That is very, very natural in the English language classroom. But we need to remember, certainly with younger students, that grammar is abstract. It's very difficult for them. Yeah, and somebody's mentioned it. Sometimes we don't contextualize it. We just try to teach them the grammar point. And we end up spending lots of time trying to teach them grammar. We don't move them forward in their overall learning. We're trying, we feel like we're trying to help them, but naturally we're ending up, we end up holding them back. Rather than just kind of moving on, maybe working on the, the fluency part, of the grammar. We spend so much time on the accuracy part that we don't move them forward. So my tip around this, if you want to build this into your professional development plans, maybe this is something that does interest you, is to make grammar learning A, more fun. Uh, somebody's mentioned songs, which is great, really a more fun way of learning grammar. Make grammar more visual, and I'm going to look at an example of that, and perhaps more puzzle-based as well. And hopefully this will answer your question, Yusra. And actually, you're going to be lucky because I'm giving you two PD tips in this one. One is to make it fun, visual, and puzzle-based. And the other is to flip your classroom. So let me talk about them. So in the image, the first image you've got, this is how we make it more visual and more puzzle-based. So this makes it easier for students to understand. Yep, they have boxes and they have colors for different parts of the grammar, and they just have to move them around. This comes from, uh, again, a primary course called Academy Stars. And it really helps. So if you do it, a verbal description, you know, we say it is this, it is this, it is this, and then we give them some practice activities. Students go, this is abstract, it's very difficult, I don't really understand. And usually they figure out, have you ever noticed that students seem to figure out how to do the course book activities? Because there's a pattern to them. They do unit one, they get them wrong, and they realize, oh, actually this gap fill is kind of similar to what I've done before. And I can take information from here and put it into here and maybe get it correct. They do that a lot, yeah? They figure out the strategies um, of activities in the classroom. Whereas if we make it visual, if we get uh, make it very active for them, they start to see that it makes more sense. The other thing you can do is to flip your classroom. So in on the right-hand side, we've got a video which comes from a team course book where we don't explicitly teach them the grammar point, we give them a video. They see the grammar being used in context, as somebody mentioned in the chat box. And then when they come to class, they can watch that video as many times as they want. Yeah, The idea is that they can keep watching it until they get the grammar concept. Then when they come to class, we're going to give them activities to help them to, to produce. 
quite often what I see is that we do a PPP uh, methodology. We do the presentation. So we spend a long time presenting to them the grammar concept. Then we have a little bit of time for practice. Yep, they get to practice it. How do I use it? How do I use it? And we run out of time. We don't get to fluency. We don't get to the productive tasks. Flipping your classroom can definitely help with that because they can get the presentation. They can do it in their own time. They can do it with a friend until they help each other to understand it. Okay, use a bit of classroom time, half of it for practice, just to make sure that they've A, watch the video, but B, that they do understand, and then give them plenty of time to do fluency-based productive activities. Good, Marwa, amazing. Use it inductively. And it'll also help to make your classrooms more motivating because when they come to class, they feel like they're achieving. They don't feel like they're sitting and listening, being passive. They're actively involved in the classroom. That might moves them forward nice and quickly. So fantastic. Great to see that. Good. Perfect. And because grammar is such a challenge, we've actually got three sessions going on at the festival. So you can register for any of these. So if you're teaching young learners, you might want to figure out uh, to watch that one because that also draws on this idea of graphic grammar, getting them to uh, problem solve using um, grammar blocks, little blocks of language, which is nice and fun for students. Uh, Dave Spencer, obviously a very, very famous author for Gateway to the World. He will be talking about how he approaches grammar teaching in the secondary classroom. And Penny Err, many of you would have read her books. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful speaker. So join those sessions if, if grammar is something that you want to develop in your classrooms. Challenge number six, time. Perhaps the biggest challenge of all. We don't have enough time. Now, I've already mentioned a few things in those previous challenges around time. If we spend lots of time trying to pre-teach vocabulary, if we try to explicitly teach them grammar concepts, we use most of our teaching time uh, with that presentation, yeah? with uh, trying to teach them various aspects of the language. And again, we want to be helping them to use language, to understand it, to personalize it, to make it meaningful in their own way. So how do you manage your time? And now this is an abstract question. You don't really need to write in the chat box for this one, but something for you to think about. If you was to make a pie chart and then divide that pie chart into all of the different types of things you do, either perhaps during a lesson or overall in your teaching, how much would it be? Would it be 50% grammar? Would it be 30% vocabulary? Would it be 50% receptive and 50% productive? All of the decisions that you make will affect how that pie chart changes because you only have 100% of time. You can never have more time than you have. So think about how you choose wisely what you do with your time. Now, one of the things, there are many, many things that I think can help us be more productive with our time. Flipping our classroom is one that allows us to do more things with students in class. Now, there are two things uh, which I think are really nice to help students with language learning in general. One I already mentioned, which is project work. But the other one I think, which I didn't mention yet, is stories. So I think that stories are one of the most powerful teaching tools that we have at our disposal. And I think that they help students to see language in context, which is super, super important for them. It's also an enjoyable format for them. And it can also be used to extend ideas and differentiate learning for a wide variety of learning needs. So a story is not just the reading activity. Yeah, it's not just here's one reading and some comprehension questions. Stories used properly in the classroom allow students to interact with language in different ways, come up with ideas. Uh, they get to, they can make projects around the story. They can create their own language. Uh, if you think about, uh, I, he was talking in, again in the previous presentation about Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, if we're just teaching them language, quite often we are at the very bottom, yeah, in that kind of remember phase. But if we want to move them up the critical thinking uh, hierarchy, up to the kind of create, stories are a really great way to get them to do that. 
So I would say develop stories in your classroom and develop stories in your classroom with all ages. Quite often we see lots of stories at primary and then they become teenagers. So we just skip stories. They're not important anymore. But actually stories are not just you know, fictional stories, open the book, you know, we're going to read together. In, uh, inspire your students to read, even as teenagers. There's loads of great literacy, uh, sorry, literary works for teenagers, for them to interact with English. Lots of people use things like Harry Potter, exposure to English uh, in a variety of formats uh, through literature is great. But also we can develop storytelling within the classroom. Turn your students into little mini storytellers ask them questions, get them to share stories. This again helps them to personalize language and it gives them uh, more confidence in the classroom if they're sharing uh, and talking about their own stories. They can create their own stories. And again, it doesn't have to be writing. They can create visual stories. They can create animations. They can create storyboards uh, using artwork. They can use digital tools for that. Um, I've got an animation um, software where I can create little animations. They can be short clips, but it's all developing this idea of narrative. You know, and then that helps them to structure out their academic work. They learn that there's a beginning, a middle, and end of a story. They uh, are exposed to richer uh, vocabulary and grammar when they're interacting with a story. All of these types of things are really good with stories. One aspect of st uh, using stories in the classroom, which you might want to develop with your students, again, in your professional development plan, is pre-reading activities. I feel like a lot of teachers skip pre-reading or it's very, very quick. Yeah, you know, we wanna get to the story as quickly as possible. We've got a story to cover. Uh, I don't have much time, so I'm just gonna get, get into the story. But actually, if we take a pause, if we take a step back, there are lots of things that we can do with students. We mentioned activating schemata having lots of discussions about what they know already. We can personalize it. So we've got a topic for the story. What does this mean for you? What does this story particularly look like in your uh, country, in your context? Uh, we can explore the topic further. We can help to develop autonomous learning. It can be very motivating. So this is around introducing, but also it can develop skills. Yeah, you can develop critical thinking skills, prediction skills. We can do brainstorming. It helps them to sequence. So before even reading the story, we could just show them the pictures and see if they can figure out the sequence. Because again, that helps them in their academic skills. And again, we can extend those skills out in terms of the sustainable development goals. So if they're doing a story about uh, a fish that's under the sea and he's gonna interact and there's a plastic bag, all of these types of things, we can have conversations with our students about it. So there's loads and loads of things that we can do when it comes to developing stories. And these all help our students to move forward. And again, there's going to be a, a session on using stories in the festival. Okay, we're coming to the end. We've got 15 minutes left. Challenge number seven with a lot of challenges. Ooh. Thinking skills. I already kind of mentioned this one, so we can probably move through this. But something I heard not quite so much recently but a few years ago, I kept hearing this. Every time I went to a school, every time I went to a meeting, people would say, critical thinking, students just can't do this. They, they don't think critically in my, in my school or in my classroom. Have you ever heard this? Has anybody ever said this in your school or have you ever caught yourself saying this? If so, what have you been doing more recently to develop critical thinking skills? We've got Bloom's Taxonomy. We've already mentioned that. There is loads and loads of work that's been done on critical thinking. One of the things that we can do is this idea of ideation. So again, we're connecting some of these some of these challenges together. We've talked about activating schemata, which is part of this process. We've talked about critical thinking and um, extending activities, using stories, brainstorming, all of these things that can help students to create ideas. Ideation is around creation of your own ideas. So again, making active uh, making learning active and not passive. Passive learning is, I've got the content, you need to know it for a test, probably. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to learn it, you're going to remember it, and you're going to reproduce it in the exam. Active learning is, okay, we have a topic, you're going to come up with ideas. Yep, you're going to work together, you're going to collaborate. We're going to see what everybody knows, 
and we're going to build on those ideas. We're going to come up with solutions, which is why those idea of the SDGs are really nice, because you can start to think of it in terms of problems and solutions. Your students can come up with the most wonderful ideas, things that you've probably never even thought of. We're never going to know those ideas unless we give them the opportunities to present them in class. So we can help them to generate ideas. We can guide them. Yeah, Someone talked before about us being a bit of a, like a counselor, a bit of a coach. We can set them up. We can give them the topic. We can give them uh, signposting about where to find out more things about that. But we want them to come up with ideas. We want them to develop ideas. And if it's going to be in a project, we can help them to communicate those ideas. Could be writing, could be songs, could be making a role play, could be creating a little TikTok video that they share with their classmates. Lots and lots of different ways that students can come up with ideas to share their ideas. So we can develop these ideation activities in our teaching plan. And I didn't want to talk too much about this one because we already mentioned it before. But if we're thinking about critical thinking, uh, one thing that I come up against when I'm doing teacher training on critical thinking is that I see lots of people uh, using See, Think, Wonder. Yeah, I see this quite often in classrooms around the Middle East. They started to implement this idea of, okay, it's a critical thinking activity. I'm moving them up Bloom's taxonomy. But as students get older, they need more complex ways to engage with critical thinking activities. So instead of just making careful observations, they start to develop their own questions, for example. So we've got the C thing one there. I know that you're good at this. I'm going to give you something that's a little bit more challenging. I want you to develop questions to provide thinking. Yeah? So instead of them just giving feedback, now they're going to come up with their own questions and perhaps ask them to each other. Again, another level up from that is something called step inside, where they have to think about things from different viewpoints. So you could give different uh, groups a different viewpoint, and then they have to have a conversation with each other about uh, something. It could be, I'm trying to think of a really good example. Maybe someone can come up with one in the chat box. It could be around how to recycle. Yep. So, okay, how do different people in different parts of the world tackle recycling? And what's the consequences of that? Okay, this group, you're going to look at it from the uh, viewpoint of students in Mexico. And for you guys, you're going to look at it from the viewpoint of people in Egypt. Okay, is it the same? Is it different? Can we understand why it's different? Yeah, and this is moving those critical thinking skills to that much, much higher level. And we can keep on doing that. So some ideas there for developing critical thinking. And again, scaffolding and moving that on, not just we do the same thing for critical thinking in each lesson, in each year group making it more challenging as they get better at it. Again, there's going to be a session on ideation in the YR classroom. These guys are great. Uh, they've got loads and loads of wonderful practical ideas and activities for generating and developing and communicating ideas. So you guys can join this session on Wednesday the 21st if this is something you're interested in. As we come to the end, we've got three left. Of course, we cannot avoid the most contemporary challenge that most teachers are bringing up. I've heard this in several conferences that I've attended in 2023 and 2024. And this is, of course, the modern challenge of AI and AI in the classroom. Should we do it? Should we not? I've heard this. I heard this in Morocco at a conference. If I give them ChatGTP, they will just use it to cheat. You guys feel like that is true or are you scared of it or are you embracing it? I know that there was um, a session, I think this morning on AI. So you may have joined that session and learned a few tips and tricks about how to embrace it. Let's see, what are people saying? AI scares you to death or are you positively optimistic that it's gonna be a force for good in the language classroom? Let's see. Yeah, optimistic, good. No reason to fear it, good. Yeah, I mean, if you go to the UNESCO uh, education page, it says artificial intelligence has the potential to address some of the biggest challenges in education today. 
It can help us to innovate teaching and learning practices, accelerate progress towards SDG 4, which is, of course, uh, education for all. But quite often, technology is moving faster than educational systems can keep up with. And this, of course, is what scares most people. What, what's it going to look like in 12 months' time? Yeah, Is AI going to outpace what we're doing in the classroom? It's going to change what we do. Now, we spend a lot of time creating lesson plans, uh, developing activities. It would be a shame if AI just kind of stripped all of that away, make us feel like everything we've done is a waste of time. We don't want that, right? We want it to build on top of what we're already doing. And I certainly think that it can. I'm in the optimistic camp. I like, I'm interested in the fact that, yeah, you think that it can make them a little bit lazy, okay? And of course, it's definitely got the potential to do that. So I didn't watch the session this morning, but I'm definitely going to go to the YouTube page and see uh, what Dr. Uh, Ron had to say about it. But I definitely think that it can help us. I think if we're open-minded and we're curious about it and we're open to learning about how it can be uh, beneficial, it can definitely help us to, to be more efficient in terms of content creation, in terms of how we get our students to interact with content. I definitely think there's lots of pros for a teacher, from a teacher's point of view, certainly from a planning point of view. Uh, in terms of whether or not students should use it, this is where the challenge usually comes in for most teachers. Should I let students use it? Should I not let them use it? I think if you let them use it to create con their own content, then yes, I think I agree with uh, this person that says it can make them a little bit lazy. The idea is that, well, we're thinking about resilience and grit. Well, you're not going to develop grit if something will do something for you. Yeah, that's that's quite natural. If I can just plug this into a into a chatbot and it'll do the work for me, why would I need to bother? So I think it can help them. So I've saw one activity. I'll I'll share this with you that somebody did. So what they do is they create something on ChatGTP, but actually you can uh, put something in the middle uh, of the the text. So I think it was invisible text. So I think they they produced two pieces of the same text. So they had a question, they put it into the prompt, it created something. But in the second prompt, they put, can you add uh, sentences, like invisible sentences into, into the sentence? And it totally changed um, the paragraph. And it was interesting because the students, uh, they didn't know that the prompt had been changed. They just had two, two sections of the same uh, paragraph. So you can use AI in this way to get students to interact with the same text, but in different ways. Maybe you could get them to come up with different types of prompts and see what AI can come up with, and then in groups to compare the different types of answers. I would use it in this way, I think, rather than you know, giving them a task, individual task, and they will just put that into a prompt, regurgitate out an answer, and then give it to you. So I think there's lots of different ways that we can use AI creatively in the classroom to get students to think about content. And again, if students do go away and put something into a prompt, they're still using English. Yep. So I think that we can use it in quite positive ways. Okay, we've got two more to get through and we've only got five minutes, so we're going to move quite quickly. There is a session on using chat DTP and the potential of that in the festival, so you might want to uh, use this. Yeah, privacy is definitely going to be one one issue. But I think we can use it as a critical thinking activity with students. Before we finish, assessment, again, another big challenge. Uh, this idea that tests are just used to prove English language levels of students. So does your school use assessment just to prove the knowledge of English of your students? Uh, is it just something that you do at the end of a unit, at the end of the semester, at the end of the academic year? Or do we use students, uh, sorry, do we use assessment in a variety of ways? Of course, I think there's nothing more hindering of student learning than a fear of assessment. If your students are scared of tests, then that definitely is going to hinder their learning. So but we can use assessment, I think, in very positive ways. And it can be a very powerful tool if we embrace it. And if we ha help students to understand that assessment can be used to help track progress, see progress, and set goals. Let's give some examples of that, making assessment perhaps more fun and more engaging for students. 
using assessment for learning and assessment as learning. I've got a couple of examples here. One is a bit like the kind of KWL charts. So this idea of what did I do? What did I learn? This is kind of self-reflection. Yeah, this idea of self-assessment. Uh, what can I do better next time? How well did I do? This idea of thinking deeply about, okay, I have just spent two weeks doing something. What did I do? What did I learn? Again, we talked about uh, mistakes. So mistakes are an important part of building resilience, but we need to understand that we made mistakes and that we learn from those mistakes. So I really like this one. Again, again, a think it over type end of unit activity. So what mistakes did I make in this unit? What did I learn about those mistakes? How can I take that experience? How can I take those skills uh, and practice them in the next unit or in the unit after? And then I can track my progress. I can go back and see, I used to be like this and now I'm like this. I've made progress from here to here. And we do that by accepting that we make mistakes and that we move forward from them. Mistakes are not bad. They are a part and parcel of learning. And the last one around goals. So do we help students to set goals? Do we come back to them at the end of the unit? Do they reflect on those goals? Did they achieve the goal? Did they achieve part of the goal? What will they continue to do to work on that goal? So we're showing them that learning uh, in the classroom is not just each lesson is an individual unit. Yep, we do something in this class and we never come back to it. And this unit, we finished the unit, that's forgotten about. Transport is done. You've learned all about transport. Forget about that. Now we're going to move on to something new. No, we can have goals where we keep working to uh, improve what we're doing in the classroom. Realize that I'm running out of time, but I've got one minute left. Oof. There's a session about this as well, exam preparation. And the last one, oh, it's not the last one because we've got two. I wanted to come back to exposure. Thinking about students using English at home, Mohammed's probably gonna jump on and stop me in a second. I want to continue to make it meaningful outside of the classroom. My PD tip for this is to develop home school connections. Students always do better when schools work with either parents or carers or guardians. And it doesn't have to just be parents, it can be siblings, it can be anyone outside of the classroom. But the more we develop homeschool connections, the better that our students tend to do. I've run out of time. I'm trying to think what the last one was. Oh, there was only nine in the end. There you go. Maybe I skipped one or there was two nines. Here's a reflection of all of the PD goals that you might want to choose from. From activating schemata, developing resilience, ideation, uh, AI and technology, assessment, homeschool connections. There are so many, you cannot develop everything all in one go. So be specific, choose one that you think you can work on with your students, create a goal, track that goal over a period of time and show your students that that is what you're working on them with. Okay, I'm gonna help you guys to develop in this particular area. If we can do this, I think that would be a very good professional development goal. Don't forget, of course, to register for the Global Teachers Festival. The website is right there. Choose your favorite sessions. That was just a few. There's actually other ones as well. So go and choose. And good luck, everybody, with your uh, professional development for 2024.